would be me. Okay, this is double trouble here. I got to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good's going to come out of this, I see. You are not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm doing is I'm getting, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to share this publicly uh, as we introduce you and uh, kind of have a, have a general conversation. Sounds and then we're going to kill the public feed and we're going to talk privately with, uh, with our platinum members and our private clients. If, if you're cool with that. Yeah. So how long do we need here? Cause I'll, I'll, I'll allocate whatever time we need to, to do that. Uh, an hour. I have a hard stop in an hour. Okay. Okay. That's cool. So let me just uh, do one quick uh, thing right here and we should be all set and ready to roll. Awesome. Okay, uh, here we go. Nick, while he does that, do you want to set the scene in terms of uh, Q&A and all that? Yep. Yeah, I'm good. So as if you're, if you're a uh, private member, you've been on other calls, uh, there's a chat box. Feel free to chat in there. Uh, but when it comes to Q&A, to respect uh, Jeff's time and ours, uh, we're going to look at the Q&A for questions first. If you can, when something comes up, uh, we're going to answer Q&A at the end. So if something comes up and you have a, a question about it, do your best to give it context. So if you say like, what do you mean by that? We're going to have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, so tr do, do your best to give us context so that uh, we, can, we can utilize the time to answer your questions as effectively as possible. And um, choo -choo -choo. let me try this one more time. We're going to get rolling here. Trying to share it in the group. Yeah. If it doesn't go, we're just going to roll anyway. All right. I'll check and see if it's working. Yep. So what I'm going to do in the meantime is introduce uh, – Dr. Jeff Spencer, who I met at an event, a mutual friend invited him to an event. Uh, what was that? It was in Newport Beach last January. I think it was actually almost two years ago, December, if I recall right. Yeah, that might never be. know. That might be. And uh, since then has become a very, very dear friend. Uh, we spend a lot of time together. Very fortunate for that. Um, but the gentleman you're looking at now, is uh, if, if, if we're on gallery view, which we should be, is uh, Dr. Jeff Spencer. And um, I always get excited to brag about him. Uh, he is an Olympic medalist, cycling. I uh, just found out recently, last time we were together, that he has glass art that's been displayed in museums all across the U.S. and a master's degree in sports science. So already we're talking about somebody um, that has done some stuff, right? Uh, then he went on to revolutionize mental and physical training across motocross, which is interesting. Uh, he's also recognized as one of the top chiropractors in the world and spent nine years as the mindset coach for the Tour de France uh, and rebuilt all kinds of stuff, which I'm sure you'll talk about. Um, went on to coach 45 Olympic world and Tour de France uh, champions, nine Olympic gold medalists, eight Tour de France championships, and 23 uh, national world-class motocross championships. So basically, you know how to win stuff. Uh, <laughs> and then adopted, uh, I, met, I met your daughter who you adopted when she was 10. Uh, that makes her 19 now? She's 21. 21. Yeah, that's crazy. Awesome. So you adopted her and spent um, the last however many years, 11 years, um, raising her. And now you're back in the game. And I am so excited you're back in the game. And so as a, as a repeat achiever, uh, what we have now and what we're going to have when I send this replay out, because we're not, it's not on a stream live on Facebook, is uh, high achieving people, high performers, uh, who should all talk to you anyway. But now we have this COVID-19. We have this shelter in place. We have a world of uncertainty where maybe we felt like we were on track to get to our goals and now we don't know what to do. And what I would love is for you to share some insight as to what does a, a repeat achiever, right? Somebody, you're the champion maker. What, is, what does somebody with a champion mindset do? Because um, we all have goals, right? You work with uh, companies that say, hey, look, I, I want to get to $100 million. 
and you help guide them through that, the process. What do we do at a time with so much uncertainty? We're stuck in home, you know, like I would love for you to walk through that process. And uh, I'm sure Dan has questions as well, but um, I'm going to give you the stage and just let you talk about what, what does a high, high performing, high achieving individual do during times like this? Well, thanks again, Nick. Uh, I think the first thing is, is that uh, anytime things start to veer off the projected trajectory, uh, the, the champions or the prolific achievers, they kind of like it actually, because they recognize that's a place where if they conduct themselves correctly, that they can gain a massive advantage in moving forward. And when the spigot gets turned back on, they will be leaps and bounds and exponentially farther along than those that remain in paralysis. So I think we need to acknowledge that first and foremost, that this is a time to, to go on the offense and it needs to be controlled uh, offense. It can't be reckless. It needs to be responsible. In the first place, you'd always want to start is making sure that you're conserving energy and resources, first thing, because we don't know how long the battle is going to go, but what we do know is that you need to stay in the game over the long term to be able to reap uh, the best value uh, from it and pop out the other side, most qualified to exponentially create your life after. And so we need to eat and sleep and exercise, spend time in fellowship with loved ones and those people that rich, enrich and nourish our souls and spirits. We need to create and maintain a level of organization in our lives that uh, allows the friction to be minimized and the opportunity to move forward uh, maximized. Got to conserve resources as much as possible wherever you can preserve what you've got, then you do that not knowing how much we may need for later. That's one of the lessons of the Tour de France. You know, it's 2,500 miles. It's the ultimate life clinic because you're exposed to everything that you're going to experience in a lifetime in those 23 days. And you can't afford not to get it right because if you don't, you're going to take yourself and your team down and there's hundreds of millions of dollars that hang in the balance of this and rain and shine, sleet or snow, you get up and do your job. You're consuming 10,000 calories a day and you're still losing weight. So again, it's not for the faint of heart, but one of the lessons there is, is that when you show up and you got three weeks and the first week when you got energy, don't use it up now because you're gonna need it later. So really covet, hang onto your energy and hang onto your resources first and foremost. The other most important thing, perhaps surprisingly, is that you have to maintain your schedule because when we're all quarantined, we get all the chickens in the chicken coop. That's not always a great recipe for good social interaction over the long term uh, or productivity. And one of the things that I, I see as a massive risk here is that there's a novelty in the quarantine where we all get a few days off, you know, to roll around with the kids and family. But like most of us, if you think a two week vacation, why is going to be awesome after the third day, you kind of want to get back home and get back to work, you know? So where I see the first derailment here is that the prolific achievers, they get out of rhythm, meaning that they start to get up a half an hour later because it's easy. Why not? We got the time to do it. So let's do it. Bad idea. Because then all of a sudden that's a half an hour of lost time, but it's also you're out of your rhythm. So you start to feel like it's a vacation. And the problem when it starts to be a vacation, and this is the death of every prolific achiever, is that you start to get too domesticated. You start to get too comfortable. Like in the Tour de France, there's two rest days on the Monday after each week. And you got a thousand miles in your mind and your body. You're just hanging on for dear life. And you think, well, let's let these guys rest in as much as possible. But you don't do that. You get them up at the same time. They put their clothes on. They go out for a three-hour ride on a rest day. And the reason why they do that is to stay in rhythm. Because if you start to feel comfortable in a nice, comfortable bed, then you don't want to go out and race. You lose your edge because you become too domesticated. So it's really important to maintain your schedule. Whatever that is, your normal schedule, stay on that pace. Because if you don't, it's like taking a, th a thoroughbred, taking them off the racetrack and putting them in the stands as a spectator. It's not going to work. So then the grouchometer goes up, the uh, relationships start to disintegrate, the guilt factor goes up. Pretty soon we're going sideways, we're apologizing for everything. We have a, a semi-productive day. Um, we start to go out and look at the kids at three o'clock thinking we're going to come back and do two hours of work, but we go out there for half an hour. Then all of a sudden we don't have what it takes to finish the day off strong. And then all of a sudden we don't know who we are. We don't know where we are. 
So stay on schedule. And uh, please advise those people that, that you're associated with that just because we're home, it doesn't mean that we're accessible during times where we have to show and demonstrate leadership, not only at home, but also in the workplace. So let's talk about leadership for a second here. Uh, leadership is being the voice of sobriety in chaos. And why that's important is that a lot of people are hanging by a thread. They're mentally at their limit. They don't know where to turn. They're scared to death of the future. They have no anchor. So we have to be that anchor for others. And let me say this is that it doesn't mean that we don't have apprehension. It doesn't mean that we don't have our own concerns, which we do, but that's kind of our business to hold sacred and deal with on our own, but to be the leader for others. And let's be really clear, that's not being an imposter. That's being someone that's responsible to the group because somebody's got to do that. And it doesn't mean that we don't need or have to be the perfect example of that to be the perfect thing for other people to see and listen to. So when we talk about leadership, there's a couple of really important parts here. And we have to have sympathy on our human nature and also the way our mind, body, and soul are looking at the environment that they find themselves placed in. And it's critical that wherever we are, we give where we are a name and a duration. Because if we don't name where we are and give it a duration, and we leave it as an open question, the mind and body and soul don't know what to do with that. They don't see a way out, so then they start to catastrophize. And then we make the boogeyman a thousand times bigger than the boogeyman like really is. So for example, um, we could safely say, like let's say it was a week ago Sunday when President Trump declared that there would be a two week projection to the height of the coronavirus infection. That's a two week period, right? So I could say to my team, okay team, listen up here. So we have a two week period between now and when the presumption of the corona infection virus will be at its peak. And we're going to call that our stay vigilant time block. And what we need to do to stay vigilant between now and then is one, two, three, four, five. So you can see what we've done. We've given the mind, the body, and the soul an anchor in a period of time that it could be compliant with. Because if you ask somebody to do something for two weeks, that's easy. But if you say, well, let's just see how it goes, oh my God, then the brain starts to spiral out. We start to lose control of everything. And we're on catastrophe mode. We start to lock up. So if we give it a time period, start, finish, and it doesn't mean we're done. It just means we'll reevaluate at that time with greater precision because we have blowback and feedback about what the real context is. And we'll decide to do what we should do at that time. Right now, it's premature to do that. If we do it, then it's just pure speculation. And we don't want to do that. We want to hang on to our energy. So is everybody clear with that? And then the team goes, yeah, man, thanks, Dan. You know, thanks, Nick. This is just awesome. I know exactly what I need to do for the next two weeks. So you've held the team together. You've showed your dignity and your ability to lead. In crisis, uh, people are looking for two things. They're looking for trust in you. And you're giving it. You're giving them that by showing up with sound counsel. They also want to know, are you believable? Yeah, because you're not promising the moon just to make everybody feel better. You're not saying there, there, everything's going to be okay. I mean, people don't want to hear that. But if you say, let's just get through this two weeks. And then once we have the declaration, then we'll decide what's next. Once we have information, they'll trust you for that. So that's the best face of leadership that I can think of. The next thing that I would say here is to um, learn three things I want to say here. Number one is that during a time of change where we have a little bit of discretionary time, I think it's really important that we have to make a declaration about some skill that we need to build now that we're going to need for later once everybody comes back online. Because if all we do is worry and clean up the garage for the thousandth time and play computer solitaire, our net preparation for future is like negative zero, you know, because nothing got done. And there is going to be a tomorrow. So the time to build the skill we need for tomorrow is when we got the time to do it. Because once the spigot gets turned on, 
then if we don't have the skill, then we're automatically behind. We're not running at the front of the pack. It's not possible. The second thing I think we need to be mindful of in this discretionary time is to take a look at ourselves as a human and say, what is it that I need to change in myself to tool up for next? You know, what are my behaviors now that are obsolete, that don't serve me well, that I have a chance to get over? Like, what is that? And then create a personalized program to learn the discipline, to be able to address that now, to weave it into the fabric of how we habitually show up for people and ourselves. So when the time comes to do that, we now own that process as a different person. And people are going to recognize that. They're going to say, Jeff is showing up different. I want to follow that Jeff because he's current. He's in real time. He's not coming out of past, trying to make past work for present. And so we need to be able to say that. And then I would say that the kind of the third thing that we need to think about, like in moving forward, is um, what sort of legacy item can we add to what we previously created that will have lasting value for what my brand is for all of eternity? Because like it or not, every one of us is going to leave a legacy of some sort. And we're living in a moment of history that's unprecedented, that's first in its category that we're part of. And we have a chance to do something here that people will look at, like either look at what Jeff did, don't do that, or he was too much of a coward to change, so he stayed paralyzed when he had a chance to step into leadership. Or it could be Jeff took an opportunity to step into a potential that he didn't have, but it drew something up in him that he embraced and cultivated to take himself to the next level. So we're demonstrating a case study for people to look at to emulate what to do in situations like that. So I feel that if we could look at those four or five things that I just said there as kind of a, a template to work from, not rigidly, but just kind of hold it to hold in consideration, then we will pop out the other side victorious in a certain way. And the last thing I'll say here is that one thing that's really important to me and the clients that I work with is that when we're on the threshold of an opportunity or a set of circumstances that may be adverse. It doesn't matter to me. The question that I always ask them is that we want to make sure on the other side of this, that this is a double win. And what I mean by that is the first win is that we academically get what we want. Like I want to get to the other side with my portfolio intact. Okay. That's an academic thing. That's the first half of the win. But to me, the second half of the win is, how did we evolve and transform for the better during that period? And if we consciously decide what that is in advance, then we can look back over this experience, which will certainly pass, and we'll be able to say something about ourselves with dignity and pride and respect because we premeditated it and we took the initiative and the responsibility of committing to, committing to fulfilling it. And that's a huge empowerment to us in terms of our belief that we can actually hold difficult spaces and we can transform within them, but also transcend them. And that's why this concept of a double win is really important for me. And it has to be decided in advance because what I do not want for anybody is to get on the other side of this and look back and say, you know what, I had a perfect opportunity to step into this with courage and with discipline, but yet I chickened out and I let my human nature, fear-based survival instincts take over, and I choked and I blew it. And when people do that, then their belief in self drops. They start to play a life defense because they're now they're not sure about themselves and their decision-making. They're embarrassed to see people. I don't want anybody to feel like that. So I feel like we have a chance to kind of decide what our future is now by some of the things that we talked about. So with that, I'll kind of turn this back to you guys and see if there's any questions or anything else that you'd like me to... Yeah, I have, a, I have a few that I would like to get on here while we're still public. Of course. Uh, you spoke about leadership. Yeah. And, uh, and then you spoke about operating from that human mindset, the, the, the fear-based, right? The scarcity-based, yes. fear-based. And so there's something that you brought up to me. Um, and for those of you listening, Jeff 
when we're not quarantined, he'll drop into the office. We'll spend hours and hours and hours together. Love those times, Nick. And uh, he said something to me. He brought up a concept where as a leader, let's say we, we operate from what you call the champion mindset. It's not the human mindset. It's not the fear-based, but we are leading people. We have a team or a family or, or whatever, right? Yeah. That are operating from that place. And so going back to leadership, I would love if you would share, I love that you, you name things like that um, and build that belief. Uh, the concept of allegiance capital, I believe that's what it's called. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that resonated with me. I would love for you to share how we can uh, develop that in our, in our companies, with our family, with our partners, all right. that stuff. Well, well, thank you. That's a concept that I derived, meaning that what a leader's job is, is to inspire the people that they lead to have a level of allegiance or a long-term commitment to them that they will follow them to the ends of the earth. And I believe that that's possible, but it's only acquired based on the extent of trust that those that are being led have in the leader. And I feel like everything a leader does has to be about developing allegiance capital because it's a bit of a currency, meaning that once you've got it, it does not self-perpetuate but it has to be uh, renewed, kind of like an insurance policy. It has to be renewed by continued acts of leadership that demonstrate to those who are following the competence of the person leading. Because what the person wants to know and needs to feel, they, don't, they need to feel it more than know it, is that the leader that they're entrusting them has what it takes to take them to the promised land. And if they feel like that, they will follow you indefinitely but they will also give you everything that you need anytime you need it. They will go the extra distance for you if you instill that. So for me, a leader mobilizes team with the idea of harmonizing all the parts because when all the parts of an organization work together because they're optimized, then they harmonize into a single unit and that's when exponential performance is possible. And it all starts with allegiance capital. So I think about that all the time. What do I need to do? It's not a giant display at the end of the year where you hand out awards because everybody's thinking, well, where have you been the rest of the year? Mm -hmm. And maybe just popping into a room and putting your hand on someone's shoulder and say, hey, it looks good. Then you leave. Five seconds. And that person says, well, gosh, you know, Nick was listening. I thought he wasn't licking this. You know, I'll follow Nick forever because he did that. So oh. it's not magnitude. It's timing is everything. Yeah, I think that's that's why it resonates because one of the I'll be transparent with the people listening. I know this is live and that's fine. One of the struggles for me is on one hand, one of the gifts that probably everybody on this call has is we kind of see around corners, right? Yeah, totally. And then it's like, God, will you just trust me? You know, just shut up and trust me. And that's not enough. But then on the flip side, how much do we need to communicate? Right. Because then we become over communicated, we get bogged down by it. So understanding that that point where you're developing and renewing allegiance capital to me was super helpful because uh, I over rotate one way or the other. Right. Yeah. That's, that's why I follow me or like way. <laughs> and, and I'm not gonna I'll follow down. you anywhere, Nick. You know that. Um, so I, what I suggest <laughs> is that people have a list. If you're a leader, have a list of everybody that you're in charge of, of and you kind of look at it regularly and you decide who needs a love, you know, you can kind of tell if a person's getting a little bit more quiet, maybe you need to pop in on them, you know, and you kind of look at the interval with which your last conversation with them was. And that'll kind of tell you the pacing on this because you want it to be appropriate. So it's really genuine and authentic. You don't want it to be. So it's like a metronome where people expect it. You know, it has to be intermittent. It doesn't have to be long. It takes a lot less effort to keep a legion capital than it did to get it originally. So these little uh, short touch points are really the secret to maintaining team harmony and unification towards exponential performance. Awesome. Uh, Dan, do you have any questions you want to get on there while we're, uh, before we go dark? Uh, I do. Yeah. As you were kind of going through the, the three items at the end in terms of how we should be using our discretionary time. You know, one of the um, things that pops into my mind is uh, this trend line that I've noticed is folks coming up with what I consider arbitrary answers to those types of questions that are fueled by uh, maybe things they've read on social media, uh, they're, they're just being heavily influenced by what they, they think they should be doing, mm -hmm. what they mm -hmm. think the right answer is to how they should be um, improving themselves and building a legacy. Uh, 
So initial question, and then I think I have a, a follow-up, more self-interested question, is what is any tips that you have for folks to kind of isolate what it is that they actually want and need rather than all the white noise of things that they, they should be doing or the right answer to, to those questions? I, I feel that that demands that we have uh, some protected time where we retreat to our personal sanctuary, where we have a breather from all the talking heads and all the experts and the geniuses out there and that we really ask the question of ourself, what do I need? And if we sit quietly with that, generally we have an instinct of what that is, if we can quiet the noise. So I think that you know, some personal time dedicated to that is an important side of it. I think another important side of this is to have trusted allies that have always been there, that will always be there to have a conversation with. We're not talking about holding hands, and talking about everything, but we're talking about having a clarification touch point to be able to guide things along a little bit. I think those are the two most important things. Uh, I would also say that don't try to be perfect on everything because then you start to obsess on details that don't matter. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is that 90% of what we catastrophize isn't gonna happen, you know? So why don't we just sort of work on the 10% that we have visibility on and let's just kind of ride that wave and then when the next, a series of insights show up, then we can kind of course correct as we move our way through, uh, forward on this. Appreciate that. Um, and then kind of the follow up a little bit more uh, precise and self interested question. So we have this kind of formal within my uh, uh, primary business kind of formal one on one process just to make sure that it happens and a series of questions to help folks kind of think about self reflect. And the trend that I've noticed with folks uh, newer into their career kind of recently out of college is even when given kind of those periods of self-reflection, they kind of come back with like, I just don't know. I don't, I don't know what, uh, what I want to improve on, what my goals are, where I want to spend uh, time. And it's been frequent enough that uh, I don't think it's, that it's a observable trend that I, I've noticed and I could hypothesize on reasons why I think that, that that's been the case. But, um, any tips on how you help folks when uh, they sort of come back with, I, I, I don't know. Well, I, I think that, that if they don't know, then there uh, deserves a, a very significant opportunity to have a conversation where they need to know because we have to be clear about what it is that's important to us and create a path moving forward. Otherwise, we drift. We start to lose confidence. We start to act in ways that we're a little bit more defensive in life. Um, we're not taking uh, opportunities quite as seriously and aggressively. To, to me, that demands a conversation. And I feel like, you know, that's the reason why you need some advisory. And when I say advisory, you may have a coach that can help you on a detail that's significant. You may have a mentor in a specific life area. But I think, you know, one type of advisor that everybody needs in their life is what I call the corner man. And a corner man is uh, a person that's older, that has a lot of life experience. They have a 360 degree knowledge of life in its totality that has the ability to do a couple of things, identify where a person is and their trajectory towards their future. Uh, they know what that means and they know what it's gonna take to get through that. And they can also uh, help that person start to define, well, if you're here, these are the options forward. Let's take a look at what those are and let's have a critical look at it. Because in my opinion, there's a lot of talk about the SMART goal, but I think more than the SMART goal, we need the right goal. Mm -hmm. And so I've actually created the right goal criteria that I work with my, with my clients to make sure that it is the right goal. It's not just a SMART one, but it, it is the right one. So I feel like there needs to be another level of conversation that people really need to engage in to be able to have a deliberate process by which they can ferret out what's real and not real uh, for them. And if you can't do it by yourself, don't spend the time trying to figure it out yourself. Find a collaborator that you can engage to help you start to answer these questions in a systematic way where you ultimately have mind, body, and soul alignment with, with whatever it is that you're proposing. So that's my best advice, Dan. Don't, don't wait and try to figure it out for yourself if you're stuck. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to go dark, which means if you're watching publicly, we're about to disappear. We're going to go, we're just going to do some Q and a and some, have some intimate conversation with private clients and platinum members. Uh, if you would like to become a platinum member right now, 
and get in on this cfeclass.com backslash offer pick platinum jump in you'll get a link to join um that being said uh about a year ago when we met uh we actually paid jeff a good deal of money to work through his goal achievement roadmap with my private clients and it was transformational for everybody and uh we've worked together and the the that actual his working with us is a full master class plus some q a and support is available uh he i have permission to sell it and he sells it as well um you can go to gar which is g-a-r goal achievement roadmap so g-a-r masterclass.com and uh it is it is a fraction of the price of what we paid for it and it is worth every penny at the price that we paid for it uh it's the whole goal achievement roadmap. What else is in there? I think it's a, the whole playbook and everything is in there. Yeah, you get a playbook, uh, you get your own scorecard. You also get uh, your game plan. I mean, it's everything that you need to systematically know how to achieve your goals and be able to achieve them at least time with the least effort. It's the real deal. Awesome. And if you've ever bought anything from me or Dan, let us know. I'll give you a coupon code to get in on that. Um, CFEclass.com backslash platinum or backslash uh, offer if you would like to continue the conversation with us we're going to go dark so we are no longer on facebook i'm actually turn off the recording we don't need to record the q a